Good evening and welcome to another YouTube sermon. As we are in Advent, I thought we would have a short Advent series and one that fits one of the great themes of Advent, which is the second Advent, the return of Christ. Uh, our reading for today is the opening section of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, specifically verses 1 to 9 of chapter 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> Let us pray. Now may the word of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our God and our Redeemer. Amen. Prepared to wait. I'd like to begin today by talking about summer holidays. Now rest assured, I'm not going to rant about missing this year's holiday thanks to COVID. Rather, I want to talk about one of my family's universal summer holiday experiences, and I assume it's fairly universal. And that is waiting for a ferry. Incidentally, I'm pleased to say, usually on a sunny car park, uh, car, uh, terminal car park, but we've almost always been blessed with good weather on holiday. That's by the by. Whilst waiting for the ferry, everyone does the same thing. Sort out the little stickers on the headlights, repack the boot, for some reason I've never fathomed, check the passports and paperwork are to hand. Then the same question occurs to all of us, how long are we going to be waiting? After about five minutes, when it becomes obvious we're not going to be shuttled on to the ferry in a hurry, people start moving about. Doors are opened, there's much stretching and yawning, food is handed out or sought after, and so are the toilets. Everything that needs to be done if you're going to be waiting for a while, as well as being ready for what comes next. Now, why am I talking about waiting for ferries? It isn't just because I missed our summer holiday this year. It is because it's the season of Advent. I have the feeling you're not seeing the immediate connection here, but bear with me. As I've said many times over the years, one of the traditional themes of Advent is considering the second Advent, the return of Jesus. That's why the lectionary for this season provides passages that touch upon exactly that theme. Now, one of the prominent themes of the second coming is being ready and waiting for our Lord's return. That's what our reading, albeit indirectly, is about. This passage is obviously the introduction to 1 Corinthians. We're only looking at this one passage. We're not doing a mini-series on 1 Corinthians. So, as important and interesting as it might be, we're not going to spend a lot of time on context. There's no need for us to dwell on the problems amongst the Corinthian Christians or Paul's long-standing and often fraught relationship with them. All we need to do is to point out that Paul in this letter is reminding the Corinthians of two things, what they've been given by God and what is expected of them by God. All of which together, together readies them for waiting for the return of our Lord. Now, what we're going to do is explore that dual, that duality, what's given, what's expected uh, in this opening, so that we know how to be ready to wait ourselves. Paul begins his letter by talking about his calling to be an apostle, but he makes it clear that he's not the only one with a calling, because it applies to the Corinthians and to all believers. We are those sanctified in Christ and called to be his holy people. So right there you have that twofold element. Sanctified means to be made holy because God imparts to us the righteousness of Jesus. 
We are made saints of God through Jesus. However, being sanctified also has the meaning of being set apart for a divine purpose. There's a reason God makes us saints. That ties in with our calling to be God's holy people. Holiness is what God gives us and it's what he wants from our lives. He wants us to be the holy in the sense of serving him and doing what is morally right and just. These two things are true. We're called to be saints by God and we're called saints by God. <clears throat> so that's the first thing that anyone, everyone needs to be ready to wait. It's being made holy by God. The second thing is unity and fellowship. Before Paul offers a blessing to the Corinthians, he reminds them that they are called along with all those everywhere who call on the name of the Lord, their Lord and ours, he says. Unity and fellowship aren't optional extras. We can't be a holy people by ourselves, nor if we are disunited, if there's something damaging our community, whether it's the old classics like gossiping, infighting, or factions. That means we can't wait by ourselves. We're waiting with all of God's people. Now, it might be a bugbear of mine, but I think it's more than that. I confess it always gets me when people say, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. But if you're a Christian, why wouldn't you? Why would you want to try and go it alone in the first place? Luther's wee parable about a hot coal cooling quicker away from the fire sums it up nicely for me. It's much easier to share the energy that we need when we're with one another. So it's about being together and helping one another to build up and preserve our unity. So we wait together because doing so together makes us stronger. Along with these two things, along with these things, we find the two things Paul mentions in all of his letters. It's a modified greeting that you would find in letters of the ancient world. Letters would normally say greetings and peace. Paul adapts it for his letters to Christians by saying grace and peace. Grace means undeserved favor and mercy. Peace means shalom. Not just physical peace and security, as important as those are, but a wholeness and well-being that we can't provide for ourselves. So both of those flow from the living God. Indeed, as Paul says, from the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because we, Paul mentions these two things in his letters, once again, we're not talking about specific requirements for waiting. But they are the things that we need to be Christians, Christians who are waiting. We can't exist as believers without these things in the first place. The most important point, though, is that they are given to us. That's what we find throughout this passage. Everything that we need, sanctification, unity, grace, peace, and the other things that we're going to be coming to, are all gifts from God. And yet there is our responsibility to rely on them in faith, to make use of them in faith. Now, Paul then goes on to be more specific. He gives thanks for the grace shown to the Corinthians through Jesus, specifically by enriching them with spiritual gifts. Now, the Corinthian Christians had been particularly blessed with two complementary kinds of gifts speech and knowledge. Now obviously those two go very well together because the gift of speech or eloquence allows knowledge to be shared more effectively. And not just any knowledge, we're not talking about theoretical knowledge, um, some kind of academic subject, not that there's anything wrong with that, but we're talking about the knowledge of Christian truth and how it applies to everyday lives. Again, it's not to say that those two gifts are specifically required for waiting, but, but they are important aspects of the Christian community, the life of the Christian community. Paul goes on to say that although they've been enriched with these spiritual gifts, they lack none of them. That's what matters, being fully equipped. 
Congregations might be particularly gifted in some ways, but all congregations have all the gifts that we need. We might often not understand that or believe that or feel that's true, but sometimes that's because we're not allowing everybody to use the gifts they've been given. Now, there's lots of controversy still about whether all spiritual gifts are still available to all believers. For example, gifts of prophecy or speaking in tongues. The point is, though, that God gives us the gifts we need to wait and expect us to use them. If we're not each of us employing our gifts, our congregations are not fully equipped to wait. And that's what Paul is specific about. The spiritual gifts are there to help us now to live whilst we wait. Paul also tells us how to wait, something of our attitude, because there are different ways, different emotions we can feel, different attitudes we can strike whilst waiting. And Paul says we do so eagerly. That means enthusiastically, expectantly, and patiently, because that's built in to the idea of waiting for the Lord. We look ahead to the revelation of Jesus Christ, his visible appearance and return, but we don't forget the responsibilities of today. We know what the future holds, Jesus will return, but we have to get there. We have to hold on to the end, and that is a work of God. Our faithful God will keep us firm so that we can be presented blameless on the day of our Lord. One commentator made the excellent point that just in this opening section, Paul talks about God's gifts in the past, the present, and the future. God makes us Christians, so to speak. We are the ones waiting for the Lord. He equips us to wait by giving us spiritual gifts. He will continue to do so, keeping us firm and ready until the end and the return of the Lord. At every step, there is the human endeavour that God calls us to make, to be saintly, to rely on and make the most of our unity and fellowship and grace and peace that comes from the Father and the Son. To use our spiritual gifts and to wait eagerly. Now, if we were to see all those human responsibilities or endeavours as a checklist, Paul would not be able to tick all the boxes for the Corinthians. That's one of the reasons he writes his letter. And, and he might fill the checklist in differently for the Romans or the Philippians. And I wonder for those who might watch this video, if you don't belong to either of my congregations, how do you think Paul would fill in the checklist for your church? And for those who do go to either of the two congregations where I am the minister, how do you think Paul would fill in the checklist for us? Now, amongst all of those different responsibilities and gifts, one of them jumps out at me for today, and that is waiting eagerly. You don't need me to tell you it's been a weird year and a hard year full of stress, undoubtedly, and I suppose for many people, boredom and stress and boredom is a lethal combination, which is why I've put on almost a stone in weight. But, the, but aside from the hazards to one's waistline, boredom and stress and the unpleasantness of this year don't make it easy to wait eagerly. Because eagerness, enthusiasm of any sort are hard to come by. That's why Advent is so powerful and so important. Yes, it's the countdown to Christmas. Only a little while and a little wait. There's always the building and excitement and anticipation for the big day. Certainly, I've noticed Christmas trees and Christmas decorations and Christmas lights going up earlier than ever before. I don't think it's because people are trying to psychologically feel as if Christmas is closer, but it's something positive, something good to aim for, something that people can wait for eagerly and enthusiastically. 
this year, it's my hope, it's my prayer that we have the opportunity as we journey through Advent to really focus on the second Advent, to take the excitement and the anticipation for celebrating the birth of the Saviour and to hold on to that excitement and enthusiasm as each day we await his return. Amen.